All right, welcome back to another episode of She Will Not Fall. I'm really excited to have my guest Heidi here. It is so great to have you on the podcast. So welcome to season two. Thank you. Thank you. So we kind of switched it up this season with our opening question, just to kind of get to know our guests a little bit. And I know this is going to be tough, but I'm going to throw it at you. Here we go. Uh, Here we go. You ready? All right. If you had to describe yourself as a song title or a book title, what would it be and why? This is a hard question. (laughs) Um, But I I spent some time thinking about it and I think I had to use my imagination a little bit. (laughs) And okay, so let's see, I'm being completely honest, like an open book. Um, I would do a book or song title with the acronyms B, B, C. Now, I'm going to explain why and what they stand for. (laughs) Um, It would be literally the three, okay, B, B, C is what stand for Brown Beloved Chaos. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Because, okay, Brown, like, we'll talk about it a little bit, but that is my identity as a Latina, I, I identify as a Latina, um, beloved as a loved woman by God, and chaos because I have a literally a very inner chaotic energy to me that maybe a lot of folks don't know, but I'm always trying to cover up. And um, yeah, that's probably like the core of like who I am. I think so. Yeah. BBC. <laughs> that is so dope. I love that. We that may Thank actually you, have to happen. <laughs> Thank you. I think you have your book title right there. Like maybe, maybe. Never know. So yeah. this season we are talking about liberation. <clears throat> and the cool part is there are women in different um areas who um are just unpacking what liberation means mm-hmm. to them. So I always like to start with the personal perspective of liberation because I feel yeah. like we all have different perspectives of what liberation is based on our lived experiences, right? So yeah. what does liberation mean to you personally? Like, how do you define liberation? Mm, yes. Yeah, that question, I had to definitely reflect on it for myself because I totally get you. We can have all these like academic and different uh, definitions that are like the bigger ones and, you know, even, um, I guess, theologically. But for my own journey, for me personally, um, liberation has meant and means me being comfortable in my own skin. It is just as simple as that. It means walking and doing life unbound um, in who I am, who God created me to be as a woman, as a Latina, as a believer. Um, so whatever that takes, like whatever has challenged that, I've had to undo. Um, and be able to tell myself, I can and am allowed to be comfortable in my own skin <clears throat> fully as who I am. Yeah, that I think, honestly, we're on the same vein. I think for me, it has been settling in my bones, like, you know, mm. and like being really comfortable with that. But I think I was telling of some friends, like maybe the other month, I was like, I realized I'm not rediscovering who I am. I'm actually discovering who I am. And so yes. that for me has been a huge part of liberation and, and yes. understanding my authenticity. Yes. Like that, yes. yeah, that's been everything and it's been freeing. And yes. of just in some ways, the pandemic, like the isolation <clears throat> mm-hmm. kind of gave me the reflection time that I needed. Like, okay, I'm away from this thing that I thought that I was. But mm-hmm. now I'm sitting with myself. And I think that's a huge part of liberation is sitting mm. with yourself to figure mm. out, okay, is am I being what is expected of me or am I being mm-hmm. my full authentic self? So yes. Yeah. And I love that you said that, that it's not really about um finding something new, but like going back to who you really are, like, you know, rediscovering that mm-hmm. in that aspect because. I just remember growing up and like feeling so challenged, like by looking a certain way, by thinking a certain way, by asking certain questions. Um, And it was, I remember the feeling of like, kind of, you know, feeling like I'm rejected or less than, or 
um, just not enough. And so that that's why you you really it makes sense. And I agree with you. And when when you say like you really hit to the core of who you are, and you kind of embrace that, and and you find freedom in, in that, you know. So yes. yeah. Yeah, it's it's so to people who are on this in that journey and on that process, I promise it's freeing. It can be a little jarring too, because you realize that your identity, you again, you have to figure out, okay, was this put on me? Am mm-hmm. I doing this because people are expecting this? Have mm-hmm. I become a caricature of myself? <laughs> like who am I? And so you really have to sit with that. So I, I love it. Um you are a writer, you are a theologian, Mm -hmm. and how do you see liberation showing up in the work that you do? As you, as you write, as you um, are, yes, like how, (laughs) how how does liberation come up for you and your work? Yeah, and I, I want to say sometimes, like, it's a little, like, scary to take that theologian title, But then I have to remember that the people that we least expect have already been theologizing for centuries and ages, okay? They have already been talking and experiencing God at different levels than what is published and what is centered and then what what we think. So even that, like, sometimes I kind of shy away from it, but then I'm like, no, let me embrace the fullness of who I am and what what we've been bringing to the table just because it's not been centered. Like, so, but... With that said, in in the work I do and as a writer, um, for me, liberation has looked like having the flourishment of our people of color, of our Latinos in mind and always like at the forefront. So whatever is not engaging in their flourishing, whatever is getting in the way is not liberating, you know, it's not liberating them. Or, or us but for me I've, I've centered my work on on kind of this like undoing of whiteness like in in our theologies undoing of whiteness in our constructs of beauty for our latinas and our women um you know and also kind of this associating or rewiring our culture out of patriarchy and saying you can be accepted fully as you are um dad feel cousin like everybody you can show emotion and for our our woman as well like you don't have to uphold the system um so it's it's been a lot of that kind of that kind of uh I think thinking in mind and rewiring or I guess changing the narrative um in that sense but I also think of like as a as a person who thinks theologically um, on a lot of things and intersects it with my faith. Um, I remember reading Justo Gonzalez. Uh, he was a theologian, or is a is a like a forefather <laughs> brown theologian. And I remember reading uh, one of his takes on the Luke and salvation, the Gospel of Luke and salvation. He kept saying that many of us think of salvation like as this like one and done like end meet goal and like we get to go to heaven after we become saved but he broke it down and and saying salvation especially in the old testament is seen as like a lot of acts like breathed and done like mighty acts of saving um that are in return also liberating so Mm -hmm. god liberating the people from the hands and the might of pharaoh you know um and we just see God's hand again over and over in the book of Judges and like all the Old Testament texts uh really redeeming and, and saving and coming through for the people of Israel so I think liberation and in the context of like our faith salvation is also liberation we can't limit it just for like all oh, one and done like decision in my heart like it's it's to free us from any power that is pretty much like oppressing us and trying to undo the image of God in us um but yeah that's that's some some of my thinking too theologically when it comes to I think liberation for a collective like group I love that 
because, and as you were saying, you were trying to undo um, <clears throat> whiteness, even in theological perspectives and even in how you see yourself. Um, and I don't think I've ever really thought about active salvation. Like, I agree with you. Like, it's always been the one and done. All right, cool. <laughs> but there is a consistency of salvation. And it is when we are oppressed in any kind of way. And when God's mm -hmm. hand moves within our oppression and God's hand can look different as far as using us to knock down those systems of oppression um can we unpack that a little bit like yeah what are some ways that you see um God's act and I, I keep saying act of salvation because I don't know what else to say because it's the language yeah, yeah. Up, but um act of salvation in the ways that we can contribute to knocking down systems of oppression like how how can God move in those ways because I and the reason why I'm asking that is because a lot of people really make God just like just supernatural right like everything yes. has to be lightning fire <laughs> like it has right. to be all right. of that but I think that oftentimes we play a part in God joining and partnering with us <laughs> in this and of course God's hand um, showing God's power, but we have to do something. So what are some ways mm -hmm. that you've seen that, um, that responsibility that we have within that, um, that process? Yeah. yeah, it definitely takes, I want to, I want to honestly say it, it, it can take a lot of discernment because sometimes we, we don't want to be the, that strong soldier getting sent to like a fire when it's like about a burn us and we're done. Like I've been, at places in my life where I felt the call of God so firmly and it has been also um, a hard place to be at, a hard place to to fight against, you know, and to to just break the mold or to uh, challenge like systems um, and stuff like that. So, so it takes a lot of disturbance, I feel. Um, at the same time, I think back to how Jesus kind of modeled us, no violence, um, no, no force. My king, he said God's kingdom would not come by, by force. You know, we, we imagine these like earthly, like dominion and power and through force and the sword. But um, uh, somebody that, that I also admire from our Latino tradition, uh, faith tradition is, Archbishop Oscar Romero, who did not really preach of a violence. He said, unless it's the violence of love, unless it's the violence that leads you to a cross, to give up and surrender and love. And I think in terms of, of doing this when engaging in oppression, it can be so hard <laughs> because that weight and that giant, right? But it's also like reminding us these are these are the powers that we are to engage with, right? Um, and the powers that like God, the divine is also ahead of us and in, in moving and doing in ways that we cannot imagine, um, you know, um, to because in the end, God is sovereign. God, God is God, God reigns. God is sovereign. Although we can't understand in the end that that's kind of what keeps us in the fight, I feel, in justice work. Um, but down here below, I think it takes a lot of communal care. And I think it takes a lot of engaging in, in love and showing a new way. So I'm not going to follow this oppressive like system. I'm not going to take part in it. In fact, my resistance it's saying there's another way and this is it's the way like engaging in love and in communal care um and yeah i think that's kind of like where where i think of how we can knock down uh systems which is very ironic because it's not like again by force it's not like you know when we when we use like uh knock knocking down system it's not how we probably expect it but 
also how did Jesus come like <laughs> in a major like he came humbly nobody people would say Jesus from Nazareth like that is the they would say modern day hood area of one's demo, uh, geographic and so just thinking of all that it's like I think we have to take all that into consideration when when it comes to fighting uh, systems and oppression um, and also being ready to to know like I said when when some of us are a little too wounded or tired to fight and say hey it's okay that's where I think the discernment comes in like it's okay, maybe you can engage in another way that's still going to liberate and that's still going to lead people away from that mess, you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I and I think I said this to someone else, like, I really think a big piece of knocking down systems of oppression is to do what you do and not allow those oppressive systems to silence you. Yes. Um, I agree. I don't think it's like us, you know, storming and, you know, all the burning stuff and just like, I don't know, whatever. I don't know if it's that piece of it. I think it is not allowing um, those systems to um, minimize or strip away truth. And you keep doing what you do, whatever it is that whatever it is that you do, um, that you're not allowing that to silence you. And I think that that's yes. a critical piece um to that you hit on something but I, I kind of want to go back to that yeah what, what does liberation look like for you as far as communal care communal care yes so I had to allow others in um my my own times of probably exhaustion or pain and so liberation is is allowing other people to love me even from these places where I felt like I, I'm, I'm unlovable or mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, appro- like my best or appropriately, like, I don't know, coming before. But that's a lie. Like, that's a mm-hmm. lie of, of, that's a lie of the devil. That's a lie of, of the image of God. Like, that is saying, you cannot struggle and that is saying you know like you are also a self-sufficient like disconnected body for the economy or capitalism but i have had to in communal care allow others to come and 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 be vulnerable and then also create this space for others to come because sometimes i feel especially right now and I was having this um this conversation and this thought with a friend and my context we're seeing a lot of these like hype mega churches coming up um you know and I don't know if it's also probably through the case of Atlanta or other parts of like uh, of the, yeah you you know already where I'm going with it. but we're seeing like these these churches like modeling these um very business model ways of, of doing ministry uh, very much like numbers and you know all the marketing is on point everything is is like a high production video in case of the church um but it's also exhausting like it's also very tiring to our our people who can come and just want to be themselves but it's like you're just being told to be another thing but it's manifested now in a different in a different picture it may not be how we were how we grew up I grew up in a very legalistic uh background you know a very like strict tradition but let me tell you like the oppression that that we had to endure by being like limited I guess in the way that we thought or theologized or even as women um it was there but there is also some other oppression going on in these churches that make you think your body can be expendable Yes. at the cost of ministry okay listen and- <laughs> testify <laughs> uh it's just been in my heart and i'm like but but it's like it's it's kind of disguised as this like hype or like up and coming thing of like u.s western maybe um maybe <clears throat> you know church culture and it grieves me because i'm seeing some of my own churches that I grew up 
you know, in the hood or churches in other small places, brown churches, immigrant churches, um, struggle and now aspire to this model. And I'm just thinking like, you know, if we keep at this, at this rate, how many bodies are going to be tired? How many bodies are going to need more? How many bodies are going to, are, are going to just want to simply be themselves um, and just be welcomed and literally just live in communal care, in true communal care. Not saying that you have to meet all these 10 steps to be a member or, you know, to like preach the gospel or something. Um, so for me, communal care has also looked like how to create spaces um, that are just for liber like a liberating gospel and no yeah. other no other gospel fluffed up or uh, nothing that's added up to make it look pretty or like I don't know I, I just know there's a lot going on there yes <laughs> right no I I totally agree and like so Atlanta is like one of the I guess I don't I guess homes of mega churches I'm a, whatever um <laughs> And there is this culture that I realize that we are not creating spaces and churches where people can rest. And when I say rest, yes, there is a physical component to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But can people rest their spirits? Can people rest their minds? Mm -hmm. Or are we creating spaces where people are still, how we love them is still attached to their labor? Yes. like we need you to do all of these things and we're wearing you down as opposed yeah. to being a place of rest and and giving you the space to connect with Jesus in a way that gives that you part. Rest. that gives you life and rest <laughs> yes like it is this and I'm with you it is this uh culture of and no knock to people but like as soon as I see it, I'm like, oh my God, it's the machine. It's the formula. Like it's the lights the are the, it's the machine. Like the lights are the same. The pastors are all dressed the same. It's like, yeah. like, oh. So I I hate to see people go to a place that should be a place that is feels restful. Because mm -hmm. and that's and I especially said that for black and brown folks. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a country, uh -huh. we live in a world where it is a feeling of always being unsafe or always being on yep. guard because yes. the things don't run. So when I come to a, what's supposed to be a safe space, yes. I want to rest. <laughs> yes, ma'am, yes. I just want to exhale. Like, I just, yeah, but unfortunately, I think a lot of places, they're like you're saying, they're trying to mimic what they're seeing because I think they see success, quote unquote. Come on. It's but it's like no, we just let me rest. That's all. Like, give me Jesus. Let me let me rest and let yes, me chill out. And Mario, I remember being told that once when I walked in a mega church. I remember being told because I said, "Well, what makes this different from the little church that I grew up with? You know, with my thirty congregants and like us getting to know each other, going to Denny's every night. Like, <laughs> why? Why is this different? You know, yes. and." I remember being told um, by my very own, like, you know, well, this is a successful church. And I was like, where, huh? does, that, where does that even get us though? And what, why, what does that even mean? Like, where are you getting, well, this is the pinnacle, this is the model, you know? And I'm like, okay, but like, how is like formation, and how is liberation and how is knowing Jesus like and walking with Jesus playing out and all of that, you yeah. know? So I just think liberation also invites tough questions. Also Ooh. invites say that again because <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, liberation invites tough questions. It does not condemn them. It does not judge, you know, um, it's not scared of them. And maybe some of us have been in, in too many places and um, around, you know, groups that have made us feel that way and therefore restrict us. But if you are in a place that is for liberation, 
it will invite your questions and invite the fullness of who you are and who is asking those questions. Absolutely. I think liberation invites exploration. There that you're go. able to explore. And like you say, I always say this, ask the hard questions, but you can also challenge those easy answers. Like, mm-hmm. like that was a little too easy. Let me challenge that. And nobody gets all upset. Like I remember being in a church where I didn't under, we were doing something and I just didn't understand it. And the person who was in the pastor's office, I guess like his um, executive assistant or something to that degree. And I was like, well, I don't think we're going to have to pass on that because I don't think we have enough time. to. Oh, we don't tell pastor no. And I was like, oh, 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 I was like, so even if the pastor is wrong, nobody can say, no, that's not a good idea. Like nobody can say that. Oh, my goodness. So maybe also liberation is accountability and people being able to challenge. Yes, definitely. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Okay, so that was a very kind of jarring experience because I'm a person that's going to mm-hmm. ask questions. Like, and if mm-hmm. it does not make sense, honestly, I'm right. saying, that's not making a lot of sense for me. <laughs> Can yeah, we unpack Clarify, that okay. clarify please, right? <clears throat> and so we've created these structures where questions well, are not welcome because they are they're trying to uphold power they're trying to like you know uphold something conceal something and it's like that first of all i'm gonna get sorry i'm gonna get in trouble but i'm like no but that's that that's that's real power for yours to keep and that's not power for yours to possess that is that was god in god period you know but, yes, yeah. like, oh, so we even have systems of oppression in our church spaces that we have to uproot. Like, we have to. And yeah, I think the other piece of this is because I think you kind of mentioned it earlier is even sometimes women will uphold systems that are oppressing them. And, and I especially see that in faith spaces a lot. Um, yes. We call them the gatekeepers of the patriarchy. That's what mm. they do. Like, okay. yeah, that's they a good one. <laughs> that's a good like, one. They protect it. And um, I was having a conversation with a friend, and we were unpacking this just a little bit. And I was like, Yeah, I said, if I'm being very honest, in a lot of the church spaces that I've been in, when I've encountered patriarchy, it has mostly come from women. And yeah. that's so, it's so weird to me, but I also understand it. Um, right, right. I think I was reading um, In My Grandmother's House by Dr. Yolanda <laughs> Pierce. Oh, and she she brings up a point that I don't think I ever considered before. And she was saying how legalistic um, a lot of her upbringing was, but she started to realize that this was the only way that they knew. And they passed that mm. down to women to Mm -hmm. for them to survive Mm -hmm. and I don't think I ever really thought about legalism from a woman's perspective and in internalizing that as a form of survival because her grandmother and the mothers in the church knew what she was going to endure and Mm -hmm. have to encounter Um, yeah yeah, exactly and so Mm -hmm. not saying that it's Right, but I can understand right. it from a generational perspective. Like we're just right. giving you what we've been given so you can survive. Right. Now with us, I think we have the forewithal to try to knock down those barriers a little bit or yeah. even help women who are upholding that. Like you said, like you said earlier, that there's a mm-hmm. different way. <laughs> yes. Like there's a different way. So that leads to this question, like how, how do you see, especially in the future, <clears throat> liberating all people, but also, but especially right. women, like yes. what, how do you project that for yourself? Like, how do you see yourself liberating women specifically, probably like in the future? And what does that look like for you? Oh, that's a good question for our women. Um, it at least again as as BIPOC as, as people of color like it's 
it's got to be one collective and two intergenerational. We have to be having these conversations with our grandmothers, with our aunts, with our mothers. Um, and one day we'll have it with our future daughters, you know, or nieces. Um, but for for that liberation is literally, I always have to keep that in mind. Um, that's, I think, what sets us apart, like, as brown and black women, um, women of color. I think, like, we bring them on the journey um, because, like you were sharing, and I love that you were sharing that, um, our, our ancestors and our, like, predecessors, women, like, they've had to take whatever was given to survive. They've had to take it with them, but like how freeing is it to again pave that new way and say well you don't have to do that anymore mom like you don't have to do that anymore like you know Thea and you know grandma like that was just something that was limiting and going forward like we can enjoy we can we can enjoy who we are how we look how we dress I mean some some of us have also been limited like with uh using nail polish or doing our nails putting jewelry you know makeup so what does it even look like to like take our mothers and our grandmothers or you know women in our community for a makeover like or just to engage in like some sort of spa day um what does it mean to also tell them this in the face of being exhausted and burnt out or uh you know from work and you know just told their body to just be just for producing work, 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 but no. Um, so that's kind of how I see it, I think, intergenerationally. Um, and then right now, future-wise, is continuing to remind that, I think, in in my own generation and, and also uh, for our future, um, you know, like women. I think it's also continuing just to remind that, like, this is a collective thing and this is for for everybody in mind, not just myself. Yeah. And liberation is a team effort. <laughs> yes. Like it is literally if I get free, but you don't. Yes. That's not liberation for me. Like I want all of us to be free. So I love that you mentioned intergenerationally because yeah. being able to even help illuminate that for our moms or you know, our grandparents, our grandmothers specifically, um, is, I don't know, that just feels so beautiful to me. Like, mm -hmm. they did it in survival, yeah. but for them to be able to experience some form of freedom, like, and, mm -hmm. and, and be completely in love with who they are. And yes. Like, oh my gosh, like that really makes me teary eyed because I just think about, you know, I wish that. So, my great grandmother, she lived to be 101 and mm. she died several, several years ago, but <clears throat> she, mm. I was like in my wow. early 20s. And mm -hmm. just hearing her story, um, she survived Jim Crow, she survived mm -hmm. the Great Depression, wars um civil rights movement like she lived through all of that she was the help right so she cleaned mm -hmm. white people's mm -hmm. homes she told me a story about how she discovered one day that she worked for um the grand wizard of the kkk <laughs> and mm -hmm. she was cleaning his room and she My opened goodness. the drawer and saw right <clears throat> and even though she consistently had to a lot of times shrink herself mm -hmm. But to me, she was like one of the most powerful women, right? Like, wow. and I think about her a lot now. And I'm like, I wish that she was still here so we could have these type of conversations and mm -hmm. that she could experience possibly a freedom that she could not experience. Like growing up, you know, and being a single mom <laughs> and mm -hmm. trying her best to feed her daughter but while she went hungry and not having, oh. necessarily, you know what I'm saying? And so, and then she, so she was like an evangelist and like all of these wow. things in the church. And though they gave her some honor, it wasn't to me the honor that was worth it, mm. you know? And so 
that's so powerful to me that if our moms, if our grandparents, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, they're still here to be able to to talk about freedom and liberation and them having reclaiming some of that for themselves. Yes. And it's even beautiful seeing like some of our our ancestors also um say I'm not going to engage in this like I'm not going to do engage in the system that is also like the liberation set up for the generations to come yes. I have yes. heard of of friends telling you know stories of how their mothers or their aunts may have married a very machista patriarchal man and mm-hmm. and then in and finding out after living with them they're like oh no this is not gonna go by me <laughs> like <laughs> i know? love it and the daughters kind of learn like that model through through the mom and and just our matriarchs as well things like this so i think that's also like setting it up um but again it's all about like creating a new way forward so um it is it is beautiful to see and and it's always a, a lifelong like learning journey because you'll you'll hear things in engaging in conversations um right with our moms and and with our grandmas and you're hearing things and you'll you'll want to lead them into questioning like it don't, it don't have to be that way anymore um yeah. you know you your your body can matter your body can rest um your body is not meant to serve or cater to a man and yeah. things like this yeah I love it so what are some lasting thoughts that you want to leave with people around liberation um do you have any lasting thoughts or things that you want to re-emphasize I think maybe just re-emphasizing um that and, and we're, we're about we're about like I think one day right before women's uh international day here on the recording um but again re-emphasizing that liberation is communal intergenerational and feeling simply like wholly comfortable in our own skin and having the freedom to like feel that way yes i receive all of that (laughs) what are some ways that people can get in touch with you to learn more about the work that you do? How can people support you? Yeah, they can find me on Twitter or Instagram with the same handle. It's Heidi, H-E-I-D-I-E-L-E-P-E. Let's go, yeah, that whole thing together. Um, That's probably the best way. And then from there, they can see some of the work I do in the projects. I love it. Yeah. Heidi, thank you for being on the podcast and just spending a few minutes as we kind of unpack liberation and how that's showing up in the work that you do. Um, I am super grateful that, you know, you took time out. Oh, no, this is amazing. Like, uh, you got me thinking about more now (laughs) liberation. (laughs) I think we're just like living through it, you know, making our own way. Listen, (laughs) (laughs) day by day. Yes. Like, it's like you, you got me to sit down and talk about it. So I'm just honored, but thank you again for this opportunity. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure having you on.